Uh, so welcome everyone to TCS Plus. Uh, today we have Uma Weinkold from Samsung Research. Uh, before we start the talk, uh, uh, just the usual. So uh, during the talk, uh, the audience will be muted, but if you have questions, uh, please unmute yourself and feel free to ask questions. Uh, the operator for today's talk is Adir Ragev and helping us out uh, with the organization uh, Thomas Vidik, uh, Thomas Hollenstein, uh, Gautam Kamat, and Clemo uh, Kanon. Uh, Odette will now go around the table and introduce all the groups. Okay, thank you, Ninja. So we have Anushe from uh, Texas A&M. Not sure you can, um, yeah, I can see. Oh, here. Hi, Anushe. We have uh, Clemo Kanon with the group from uh, oh, Colombia. Hi, guys. And we have Piyush from Caltech. Hi guys, hi Toma. And uh, we have a co author here, Ron. Hi Ron, Ron Altblum from MIT. Uh, Shavas Rao from the group here in NYU. Hi Shavas. And we have uh, Sorachai um, with the group from uh, Michigan State, or he's from Michigan State. And Yijun Chang from University of Michigan. And here, here we go. Okay, so back to you, Anidia. Uh, great, thanks, Adit. Uh, so, uh, to the next few uh, talks, we have uh, we have uh, a couple of talks scheduled at this moment. So, uh, two weeks from now, we have Ankit Gurg, and four weeks from now, we'll have Eric Blay. Um, and so, today's speaker is Omar Weingold. Uh, so, Omar, of course, has done a, a vast amount of work in cryptography, pseudo randomness. So. Uh, uh, he was responsible, uh, so back in speech, he was responsible for uh, creating uh, pseudo-random functions, constructing pseudo-random functions in TC0. This was followed by a spate of work in pseudo-randomness, including uh, the exact product for construction of expanded graphs, the famous SL equals L result, uh, and a lot of other works in pseudo-randomness. Most recently, he turned his attention to uh, privacy, uh, data privacy, and uh, he had a very influential result last year, which was in uh, science. And today, Omar is going to talk about uh, delegate. Oh, so sorry, I forgot to mention. Omar has, of course, won a number of awards for this, including he's an ACM fellow and got the ACM Grace Hopper Murray Award. Uh, so, uh, and the Griddle Prize. <laughs> sorry, that was a long list of prizes. I keep forgetting. <laughs> uh, and Omar is now going to talk about. Uh, Omar is going to talk today about uh, delegation of computation. So, Omar, thank you. Thank you, Aninja. And I think there's nothing more to tell about me <laughs> ever again. <laughs> uh, thank you for the organizers. It's uh, it's great to to take part of it. It's the first opportunity that I have to to give a talk in my underwear. I'm not saying I'm I'm doing that, but you, you'll never know. Thank you for the audience. You know that the same machine that kind of broadcast me can also show Netflix. So just um, just in case you didn't know. And I'm going to talk about kind of new uh, interactive proofs that are particularly suited for uh, the setting of a uh, work delegation computation. And uh, I was lucky to work on it with uh, Guy Rothblum and Ron Rothblum. Ron is in the audience, so when the questions get tough, the, the Ron will get going. Um, okay, so let's start. So the, kind of the motivating uh, setup is when is that of kind of a cloud computation, Internet of Things, or whatever they, it will be called next year where you have this uh, kind of weak computational device, and when there is some heavy computation, it's very natural to try to delegate this computation to the cloud, to some servers on the cloud. And, uh, and that's easy. You send your input, you get your output. Uh, but of course, uh, we don't necessarily want to trust the cloud. And there are various reasons to, to worry about. Um, so, for example, privacy and various system considerations. But we'll focus here about correctness. Because, after all, what's the motivation for, um, for, the, um, for the server to even carry on the computation rather than to send an arbitrary number, like 42? 
so, so what we'd like to do is to augment this kind of basic kind of approach with a proof. So the server will have to compute the function, and in addition, uh, also to prove to this weak uh, client that the computation was done correctly. Uh, okay, so we we have this interactive proof. Interactive proofs are not new, of course, uh, introduced by uh, Goldwasser, Mikali, and Rakoff. And uh, let me define them very quickly. Uh, let's say in the, in the setting where you want to prove that a particular input common to the prover and the verifier is in some language, the prover and verifier interact, and the main properties are the following, completeness, here it's perfect completeness, it's not very important, but we get perfect completeness. So when the verifier accepts, uh, sorry, when the input is in the language, the verifier will accept with probability one, you can convince the verifier that, that that's indeed the case. Whereas if X is not in the language, uh, even a computationally unbounded uh, cheating prover can convince the verifier, cannot convince the verifier that the input is in the language. So with very high probability, the verifier is going to reject. So these are the two properties. Uh, but uh, it, for our case, we really need very strict efficiency considerations to, to make the, the whole thing make sense. So I'll, I'll just say that they are very powerful. We know the, the famous uh, IP equals P space, but again, here we want a much more efficient version of interactive proofs. And this was introduced uh, uh, by uh, Goldwasser, Yael Kalai, and, and Guy Rothblum. Uh, and they called it doubly efficient interactive proofs, where you have a strict efficiency requirement both on verifying and on proving. So you want the double efficiency means that the verifier is super efficient, the prover is relatively efficient. What do I mean by that? The verifier uh, work has to be much faster than computing the function, otherwise there is just no point in it, right? Instead of delegating the work, you can compute the function by yourself makes no sense. So much faster than computing the function, we'll think about kind of linear, quasi-linear verifiers. In some settings, you don't even need to be linear, uh, but let's let's say linear. The prover should be relatively efficient, meaning that you need to be, um, the, the, the proving shouldn't be much harder than computing the function. And then in that case, uh, the proof would come almost for free, in the sense that anyway you're doing work, the work of computing the function, that's what you have been delegated to do, now you're proving, and we want this additional work not to be much larger than the original work. Um, okay. And in addition, we also want kind of to minimize the interaction, and especially we want to minimize the number of rounds of interaction, uh, because this is usually a very important uh, uh, parameter. Uh, so, so in the IP equal P space, uh, the proving, uh, the prover is exponential in the, in the space of the computation. So we want something much, much more efficient than that. Okay, so let's compare with these kind of classic notions of interactive proofs. And here is kind of a table. For the classic interactive proof, the verifier is polynomial time. The honest prover is unbounded, or as I said, exponentially uh, in some parameters. And the cheating prover, so it's good against any, any cheating proof. So here, this is a good thing. Uh, for doubly efficient interactive proofs, we want linear time or almost linear time verifiers. We want the honest prover to be just polynomial time. And we still have this strong requirement that you're protecting against even an unbounded cheating prover. Okay. So that's that. If, I don't know if there are questions. It's a very strange experience to, to have such silence. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, I'll cope with it. OK, so prior work. Um, in, in this notion, so, so the same work that kind of introduced this notion also gave doubly efficient um, 
interactive proofs for bounded depth circuits, which are log space uniform. Now, in terms of the number of rounds of interaction, it grows uh, uh, with the circuit depth. So it's essentially, I think, the circuit depth some times some polynomial. So it can pr cannot produce a constant number of rounds. So that's when you're protecting against an all-powerful uh, prover. When you want to protect against a prover, a cheating prover that is computationally bounded, so this is what's known as arguments, and here we can use cryptography. There have been a line of work, uh, quite powerful sequence of works, uh, that give various kind of uh, interactive proofs with very few messages uh, based on uh, pretty strong cryptographic assumptions. So, um, yeah, so I, I won't go into the details just because in our case, we, we want something that does not rely on crypto and protect against an all-powerful cheating prover. Okay. So that's the prior work. And, let, and this is our main result. We give uh, these doubly efficient uh, interactive proofs which are at the same time constant now as co a constant run number of rounds for a pretty big uh, set of functions. So these are all the functions that are computable in polynomial time. And we'll see this, this is unavoidable. And space, and to the delta. So this is kind of the tableau of the computation. If you think about writing the, the, the state one by one according to time, this is the tableau n to the delta over poly, poly n, where delta is a fixed positive constant. So our, all of our parameter will be polynomial in the space. So if you want, let's say, linear verification time, we need delta, which is smaller than some fixed constant. And Potentially, n? yeah. Sorry, uh, what is n, input size? n is, uh, yes. Uh, yeah, I think so. And thank you for unmuting us. <laughs> uh, yes. Right. So you have you are computing a function on, on n bits, let's say. And when you talk about uh, near linear uh, near linear time, that's uh, in n in the input size. In the input size. Okay. So so this is the, the uh, function. Omar, uh, sorry. So another question. So this delta, you said, uh, as delta increases, the verification time will increase. Like, can yes, you? We'll, may see, we'll see the general result uh, in a second, but uh, let's the verification time will be the the memory to to some power. Let's say ten. Okay. I mean, hopefully we could uh, we we could improve our res uh, result to get let's say n to the one minus one one minus delta, but but not at at the current form. Okay. So currently it's n to some delta. So let's see the, okay. So let's first talk about kind of the tightness of this result and then I'll, I'll give a more general form. So, um, so this, so let's call the function that you could potentially compute IPDE, so uh, doubly efficient. So this is the set of functions. What we showed, it contains everything that can be computed simultaneously in time poly n and memory n to the delta. It's easy to see that it's it contained in BPP because you can simulate the entire uh, prover verifier together in, in polynomial time and so this would give you a BPP algorithm. So, so it's contained in BPP. It's also not very hard to, to show that it's contained in space n. So you can do the computation in space, which is essentially the the communication. Uh, so there is the one one thing in which we are not tight is this n to the delta versus n, and and we could potentially see ourselves pushing this delta towards one. Another thing is that the requirement our requirement is that it should be simultaneously in poly n and n to the delta. There is one algorithm that that both, and just this very simple argument shows that it has to be, both requirements have to all, but not necessarily simultaneously. 
So this is where we are in terms of tightness of the result. I mean, what we know how to prove. Sorry, I've got, I've got a small question. Uh, so in the first slide also, you said you actually achieved perfect completeness. So shouldn't that actually give it a slightly tighter bound in, instead of BPP? Uh, yeah. Um, instead or? So you say in perhaps RP? Yeah, I don't know. It's a good question. Per, uh, you, potentially, it's not two-sided. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Um, I mean, yeah. Potentially, I'm not sure about it. Uh, I mean, randomness ca errors can come from various uh, ways, but I mean, yeah. Right, perhaps it's RP. I mean, it sounds reasonable. And Ron is not objecting. I gave him uh, half a minute, so it, it could be okay. <laughs> so, 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 um, so that's the gener more general setup of the result. Uh, I mean, you don't need to obsess about it, but essentially, when you have a, a language in BP time space, so time T and space S, the verifier time will be 2 to the epsilon times poly S plus N times poly log T. Now note that without this T to the epsilon, we would be pretty happy with this. And prover time is T to the 1 plus epsilon, so it's actually very close to the original time times poly S. Communication is T to the epsilon times poly, t, poly S. All of this is pretty nice. The number of rounds is a bit larger than what we would expect and, and hope. It's exponential in 1 over eps, uh, epsilon. And it would have been nice if it was polynomial. Uh, in, specifically, if we could get all the way with polynomial dependence on 1 over epsilon to epsilon, which is 1 over log t, then all of these t to the epsilon things would disappear. And we'll get something that's pretty nice and pretty close to what we would, we could call an efficient version of IP equals P space. But, and we can push epsilon to be smaller than a constant, but not all the way to log to the T, but one over log to the T to some constant C. So that's kind of the general result. If there are no questions, let, let me proceed. So let me mention, uh, first compare it with with previous results and mention uh, then a few uh, a few corollaries. Uh, so so this result simultaneously improved things in two directions. So first it shows that this class IP, uh, IPW efficient is much larger than we previously known. So that even if we disregard the fact that we do it with constant number of rounds, uh, we, we can uh, do things that are much, much uh, larger. And um, and if we look at constant IP, then previously with the linear time verifier, we didn't know even how to do log space. And this, even if the prover, if we ignore the requirement that the prover is efficient. So even with the prover, which it was unbounded, we didn't know how to do that. So this is improvement in both, in this both uh, sides, both for doubly efficient and, and for constant number of rounds. In terms of corollaries, there are a few of those. Let me just, let's say, say one of them, uh, which is a, a succinct constant round zero knowledge proofs for a, for a pretty large subset of NP. So think about NP. Uh, to prove that, that, uh, that an input is in, the, in an NP language, all you need to do is send the witness. So this will require you the number of, of bits, which is only dependent on, on the witness. Uh, but when you add this additional requirement of zero knowledge, then now, uh, even if the witness is small, you don't necessarily, you're not necessarily able to do something with such low communication. Instead, you'll, you'll do something which is related to the verification uh, procedure. So if the verification is much larger than, than, the, than the size of the witness, the communication will be much larger. 
So here is the verification. For a pretty large subset of verification, you can do a succinct uh, constant ground zero knowledge. Okay. So got it, you got it, doesn't really matter. We'll, so these are the corollaries and, and, and we'll, we'll abandon them unless there are any questions. Uh, yeah. Okay. This is, by the way, to add music for those who want to look a bit more closely, but I don't know what will happen if I'll use it in this setting, so. Okay, so let, I want to give you a little bit about the proof. Uh, and, uh, and, and let's see how far, how far we get. So we have this language. This language uh, is computable in time t and space s. So this is, again, this tableau of the computation. So at every time step, time i, this is the this is the state of the computation. And now we want to construct an interactive proof for this language, uh, such that the verification will be much much more efficient than time t, because in time t, the verifier can just compute the function uh, on on their own. So we want to do something that's much more quick. And we've learned that to, to solve complicated problems, what we usually do is divide and conquer. So let's try to first divide. So dividing will be easy. To divide, what we can, we can ask is for the, the prover to send intermediate states of the computation. Let's say k intermediate uh, states of the computation. Uh, and and now, to, to verify this entire computation, that the computation was done correctly, we, we are left with k smaller verification tasks. So I need to verify that from here to here, uh, that, that starting in this state, I get the state that the prover sent me before. And starting from this state, it was sent by the prover in t over k steps, I'll get to this to this state. So instead of uh, verifying one computation of size t, I need to verify t, uh, k computations of of time t over uh, t over k, and these computations have the same space, so sp space didn't change. Okay, so this I mean <laughs> this was very. Uh, Simple. I didn't do much. The question is how to, to conquer, how to do, to do all of these things together. One thing to do is just to verify everything. I have k, k subcomputations. Let me verify all of them. And so let's recurse on all of them. And the problem with that is that eventually the, the prover will send all of the states. So verification time will, and communication will be larger than t, and that makes no sense at all, because the prover can just compute in time t and, and come up with these states on their own. So if we can do all of them, let's do, do just a few of them. So let's select at random a few, let's say one even, and, uh, and, and verify that one. Problem here is that we'll, we'll have huge soundness error. Because it's not hard to come up uh, with examples where um, there is only a single place, a single uh, part of the computation which is wrong. So let's say if, if I switch this state with a state that, that would lead us to the accepting state, then everything up to here would be okay and everything from here will be okay and only if i choose to verify this computation i'll be uh, i'll be catching the cheating prover so the cheating prover can make it such that there is only one of the k computations that are that is wrong and if i didn't choose it then 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 all is lost okay so these two things are are bad what I do want to, to have is the, both of, the best of uh, both worlds. So I want a way to verify k computations much more efficiently than k independent verifications 
of, uh, of these computations and without sacrificing the soundness. Okay. And we call this task, which will be the central task that we'll, we'll handle, amortizing interactive proofs. And I don't know if it's perfect name, but uh, it, the, the name comes from the fact that the amortized cost of each computation is going to be much uh, cheaper than than originally. Okay, so that's where we are, and that's what I'm going to uh, concentrate on. But uh, I won't even uh, discuss the the general case of amortizing interactive proofs. Let me uh, let me talk about amortizing NP uh, verifications, which are going to be simpler and would contain many of the, the ideas or the, the main idea of the of the proof. Uh, so we we'll focus on amortizing NP. So in this case the prover has and the prover and the verifier have uh, k inputs x1 up to xk and the prover has k witnesses w1 up to wk and we want wants to convince the verifier interactively uh, that that all of these uh, inputs, all of these XIs are in the language or in the corresponding languages. Let's th think about just one language in the language. Um, and to do it with communication that's much smaller than M times K. So M is the length of each of a witness. I can always send send just these K witnesses. Instead, I want to send communication that's much smaller than a, than k times m. Okay. Somebody unmute and say something just so I don't... Uh... Okay. Okay, this is obviously impossible, right? <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. That, <laughs> that was great. You both gave me some <laughs> feedback and uh, the best feedback. Uh, and actually, it's a great question if it's possible or not. We don't know how to do it for NP statements. Uh, we will show how to do it for unique P. So NP, NP statements that are known to have a unique witness. So kind of. And for that we know how to do. It's not clear if you can do it in general for NP. I think it's a great, it's a great open problem. Um, we don't need it for, I mean, it's just interesting by its own. It's related to uh, to to a work on kind of succinct uh, NP proofs, but but this is a very specific kind of of thing we're trying to prove. We want to prove that each XI is in the language, so it, potentially it is possible that we can condense. And and for UP we are able to condense. Okay, so thanks. Okay, so we will be amortizing UP statements, and, and there is more, no more simplification. Now it's, it ends. That's what I'm going to show you. Uh, so UP is, again, a restriction of NP, where for yes instances, there is a unique accepting witness. So for example, unique SAT, and where we need to distinguish the case uh, where a formula is unsatisfiable from the case that it has exactly one satisfying assumption. Assignment. Uh, and the theorem that we that will show is that for every such language, there is an interactive proof for verifying k statements with communication which is order k plus polynomial in the witness size times a uh, log k rather than, than k. And the number of rounds will be log k. And actually, there is a trade-off between these two parameters. If I'm willing to put here not uh, log k, but uh, k to some alpha, then the number of rounds will be constant. In fact, this is what I'm showing. I'll show when you get this result by recursion. Okay, so that's what I'm going to show. Okay. Uh, okay, so let's, so we, what we'll do is, is try to do this uh, amortization. We'll do it in a, in a sequence of kind of very naive attempts that will do something slightly more uh, sophisticated each time. 
but I warn you that, that the point in which we move from something that is naive or even completely stupid to something that works will be very quick. So you need to pay attention. It, it, it comes and goes. So to look stupid, stupid, stupid works. OK. So that, that's my, my fair warning. OK, so the, we have the prover with the inputs and the witnesses and the verifier with the inputs. And what we'll ask the, the prover to do is internally compute this um, KPCP proof. So for each one of these witnesses, produce a PCP proof that X is in the language. So just to remind us, PCP proofs are proofs that can be verified probabilistically by only looking at, let's say, a constant number of locations. Uh, so if this was somehow committed to, it would be very easy. What we'll have is the verifier would generate the PCP queries for, for, this, for these uh, proofs. And we'll assume that the, the queries can be the same for each one of these lines. So the queries will be independent, and we can make this assumption. The queries will be independent of the, of the input. What you eventually verify will depend on the input, but the, the queries themselves are independent of the input. So I'm generating uh, PCP queries, sending them to the prover. The prover will uh, give me the answers for each, uh, for each one of these proofs according to these, uh, these queries. So it sends the restriction of the metric A, A to this um, constant number of columns uh, specified by Q. And now the verifier will accept if all the PCP verifiers would accept. Um, OK. So that's, yeah, that's naive uh, one. Uh, if you were uh, un all un unmuted, you would not shout that it's uh, ridiculous. And the reason it's ridiculous is because, okay, so first it's great, it's, it's very efficient, you only send order k bits, but it's completely insecure. And the, the point is that it's true that you only need to read a, a constant number of bits, but it's only once the PCP proof is written and, or, or at least committed to. So once you see, once you see the queries, it's it's always trivial to come up with answers that satisfy the queries. Uh, so the order is completely wrong. You can't first ask the question, the PCP queries, and get answers. You first need to commit to the entire PCP, then ask the questions, and only then, only when you're committed to it, you can you can do that. So, oh. Sorry. Yeah. Just one question: Is it obvious why you can choose the same location in all PCP proofs? It's, it's a whole column that you take, and you know, all just different entries in each. Um, so, so it's just a property of uh, of of existing PCPs that they can can be can only depend on the uh, on the, the language, language, not the yeah. instance. Okay. Yeah, it can be completely ob uh, oblivious of of that. I think potentially we could have uh, we could have handled something else. So the parameters would be harder, but but it's definitely convenient. Okay, uh, so that's that's that. So we need to somehow commit to uh, okay to commit to all these PCPs. But the thing is that we are in a information theoretic setting. We don't have crypto. We can't commit to this metric. Or the only information theoretic way to commit to it is by sending number of bits, which is the same number of bits of this metric A. So this metric A is much too large to send. This is k times m, or k times polynomial in m. We can send it. So how the hell can we com commit to it? We'll commit to it. Let's try to do the, 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 the basic information theoretic commitment. So we'll take the XOR of all of these rows and take this as our commitment. So we're going to send this uh, uh, check, <laughs> check sums or some checks or uh, check, <laughs> check sums to, uh, to the verifier. So this is, this is going to 
to be our commitment. And now we do the same thing as before. So we're, we're generating PCP queries, we're sending them, we're getting the answers, and now we're going to do two things. We're going to verify that all the PCPs were, would, would uh, be satisfied, all the PCP verifiers would accept, and also we're going to check that we are consistent with, with this uh, um, commitment that we have. Okay. So, this is still, of course, not sound, and it's not sound because, as we said, we need to commit to the PCPs, and we didn't really commit to the PCPs. We, get, we gave you a little bit of information, but it's still very easy to fool this kind of, of, um, of, of an interactive proof. But in a, for a very, very restricted form of prover that we're going to call single deviation prover, this would still work. Okay. So we'll make two assumptions about the, pre, uh, the prover or about the setting. The first assumption is just for convenience, and this is that there is only a single input which is not in the language. Right? We want to convince you that all L inputs are in the language, all K inputs are in the language. Let's assume that all but one are indeed in the language, but one is not. It almost sounds like the hardest uh, case, but anyway, this is just for convenience for now. The serious assumption that we're going to make, which is uh, completely unrealistic, is that the prover uh, will kind of uh, act honestly, uh, in a sense, on every uh, input that is in the language. So whenever, uh, so in, particularly in this matrix AQ that the prover is sending, even the cheating prover, all the rows uh, that that are uh, uh, that are that correspond to inputs in the language will be sent according to the the, the real PCP proof. Okay, and so the it, the, the prover can only cheat on one row, the row where, where there isn't any PCP that would prove. Okay, so this is unrealistic, and, and now you'll say, oh, then of course it's going to work, it's such a stupid thing, because the, the prover is already committed to almost everything but one row, and therefore sending just one row of, as a commitment could commit the prover altogether, and indeed that's the case. This C commits the prover to the one remaining row, to a PCP proof for the remaining row, so this PCP proof. The proof that you get by XORing C, this row, with all the uh, PCP proofs that the, the, the true PCP proofs for the inputs that are in the language. And now we are in the setting that PCP works. So now the prover is forced to be consistent with this one string, and soundness is saved. Okay. So as I said, stupid, stupid, a little bit less stupid, and then it works. So this is the second stupid. A little bit less stupid is that, okay, we managed to work with the prover that only deviates once. Uh, let's, uh, let's allow the prover to deviate d times. I mean, it worked for one, it certainly can work for 10, or whatever D is going to be. Instead, but then instead of committing with one row, we're going to commit with essentially D rows, or D times log K rows. So if we take these checksums or something like this, intuitively this would hold against a prover that is only allowed to deviate for D rows. More formally, we're going to take an encoding and it takes uh, k bits and produce d or d times log k bits with the following property that if x and y are of, uh, of distance at least d from each other, their uh, commitment, I'm thinking about it as commitment, will be different. And so now we can uh, work on our proof and, and 
produce this commitment uh, C by applying our, our encoding on every column. So for every column we're going to, to imply to use this, uh, do, uh, this kind of encoding. And now we have a metric C, uh, which is a larger commitment. It's still much smaller than M times K, so it still shouldn't work as a commitment, but it will work as a commitment against D deviations. So as long as you're committed to all but D, D columns, this would commit you to the remaining D columns. Okay, so, so this is, this is actually where, <laughs> sorry, so this is the second stupid that doesn't work, but actually it will work. So now you need, this is the half a minute to pay attention because now it's going to work. Oh, did I jump? Okay, sound, sorry. So it will be half a minute rather than a second. So the, the prover now has two options. It can either deviate on less than D rows, but then we are okay because this is a, a D deviation prover. And so the prover cannot, cannot cheat us this way. So then you need to deviate on more than D rows, which means that the answers are going to disagree with the unique PCP. So this is where we're using the uniqueness, unique PCP for more than D rows. So to begin with, the prover needed to cheat on one row. But now, because of the way we set things up, now the prover is going to cheat on D rows. So even on D, on rows for which there is an input, there is a satisfying uh, witness. And so what the verifier can now do is concentrate or select at random roughly K over D statement and ask for the prover to send the entire PCP for these statements. And the point is that for every row for which you deviated, you can't send a PCP which is both convincing because there is just one of those, the unique PCP, and consistent with what you sent before. So let's see the, the final, uh, Find the protocol, so we've seen that. You compute these uh, checksums, you're sending them, generating PCP queries, sending the, the subset of the metric. You check that all the PCP verifiers accept. You check that this is consistent with, with the C. And you ask for a, sub, a random subset of the rows and ask for all of these PCPs. And now you verify that they are consistent both, both with what was sent before and that they, they, they are actually uh, the right PCPs. Okay, so that's the protocol. That's where it worked. It does work. So you, you, you decide that you want to send the PII so that the verifier doesn't have to compute it alone? It, in principle, it can do that, right? Yeah, it can send the, the witness. You're right. But then yeah, the but verifier would have to compute it. Computer. Then the verifier would need to uh, to compute it. So, yeah. So, so the way I said that you send the entire PCP, so there is no computation. You can sample it very in you know, just a few places. Uh, but the computation is not M, but poly M. So this is the trade -off, trade off that you can consider. Actually, we're not even going to send these pi eyes. We're going to do things recursively, as we'll see in a second. Uh, but just as a standalone, you can do either of them. You can either send the witnesses or, but yeah. Uh, okay. The uh, thing is that you already uh, sent, uh, so you already sent, just one second, you already sent something that's, that's of the length of a PCP proof. So it's not clear you, you have so much to gain from not sending them. Okay, sorry, I need you. Yeah. Uh, the number of rounds is restricted to four here or five, right? Constant number of rounds. But in general, you're not restricted to use just the constant number of rounds, right? 
And no, so we eventually in, in possibly our main result, we have a constant number of rounds, but um, for this result, you'll, you'll see there is a trade-off uh, between the number of rounds and the communication. So the communication here would, so let, let's, let me go one more slide and, and then we can discuss it again. So the communication, is, as I said, it is, uh, this is, this is the length of this uh, metric C, the commitment, the, the checksums, plus order K for the PCP proof, uh, proofs, and plus K over D times the, the PCPs. And we can optimize it by setting uh, D to be square root K, which would mean that our communication is square root K times poly M plus order K. And um, so here it was constant number of rounds, and we saved something. Instead of having k times m, we have something that's only square root k times something that depends on m. But the point is that you can use recursion to reduce it further. Because there is no real need to send all of these PCP proofs, you can view it as a, as a new problem. Now you'll need to verify all the, all the, all the statements in this set S. But the point is that now you need to verify a slightly more complicated statement. It's not a big deal. You need to verify that that these XIs are in the language, and also that the, the PCP proof that proves it is consistent with what was sent before. But essentially what it means is that now we can go to smaller and smaller uh, roots of K with, a, with still a constant. Or we can get the result that I stated before with log k rounds of communication. You can completely remove this dependence from. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So you verify that x i is in the language and the values of pi i are the same. Okay. So that's essentially what I wanted to say about the proof for the for the for up statements. It's a great place for more questions if needed. I have a small question. Uh, if you allow more than one prover, like say two provers that can't communicate once it has started, is there a way to make things more efficient by in the last stage making them play against each other when you want to verify these uh, K over D PCPs? Um, yeah, so A, I, I don't know even if the problem is hard for, uh, so that's where Ron is unmuting himself. And telling me if if it, if this result is is not yeah I think so I think everything becomes very easy so you can use uh, MIPs for uh, NP just just uh, two provers with one round of communication and get a uh, linear time verification uh, for NP okay so that, that just using PCPs okay thanks so, so the, yeah that's what I suspected okay. So I want to tell you a little bit about amortizing interactive proofs. Uh, not much, so I think we have 10 minutes. Um, essentially, the same kind of ideas work. Of course, a little bit more complicated. But the main uh, source of, of, the main thing you need to do is to find interactive analogs of the basic tools that we've used. So the basic tools that we use are these PCPs that allow you to verify things just with a few, within a few bits, and UP, so uh, unambiguous or unique uh, NP statements. Uh, so we need we need the uh, proofs. So that was a very important thing for us. In our proofs, even when the statement is correct, X is in the language, there is only one way of convincing that the statement is correct. Once you deviate from this way, you're not going to succeed. So we do introduce these notions, these interactive notions. So for uniqueness, we replace this unique P with unambiguous interactive proofs, which we introduce. And uh, for local che checking, we replace these PCPs uh, with what we call probabilistically uh, checkable interactive proofs, uh, PCIP. Uh, okay, so let me tell you a slide for each one of these, these objects. The ambiguity that we're going to use is very strong, but fortunately we can, uh, we can get it. And the point is the following. So 
you you have an interactive proof and and what we we require is that even for a language for an input in the language the moment that the, the prover deviate from the prescribed uh, protocol um, then the verifier will reject with high probability and the rejection is only with good probability on the remaining coins so the moment you decide to deviate you're going to uh, you're going to be caught the example is the sum check protocol right in the sum check protocol you you give me these polynomials that are sums of of a lot of things the moment you give me the wrong polynomial from now on i don't care that originally there was a there was a right polynomial, but now you gave me a wrong polynomial, and you're going and 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 I'm going to to catch you. So again, it's it's a, it's a right. So the moment you 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 deviate from now on, I have good probability of uh, of catching you, and you pick a response to a once a method deterministic uh, UIP because you're just sending one message. And if you're going to deviate, then I'm going to catch you. But here, there'll be several messages, and the moment you deviate, I'll, I'm going to catch you with good probability. So that is the notion of unambiguity for interactive proofs. And these PCIPs, these are going to be uh, public coins, interactive proofs, uh, but so, so we run this interactive proof, but you can imagine that somehow, okay, it's good that I only have 10 minutes. Uh, so. Why uh, need to connect to a power supply? Because this takes lots of power. Uh, well, uh, you, let me just use the opportunity. Can you explain what, what, we, what are we doing now? Why are we doing this? I'm just, I'm lost. Right, so, so, okay, okay, excellent, thank you. So I've been talking about Originally, I wanted to to build. A, a, you know what? Perhaps I should run and bring the the cable before we we dive. Okay, right? put some music or the Netflix. Uh. <laughs> okay. So you put the music. I'm bringing it just so. <laughs> okay, just thank Maybe you. you can ask Ron to explain. <laughs> so Ron, can you take over and explain? Uh, sure. Where, where are we? Exa are we proving the main theorem? Are we done with the main theorem? No. So the goal overall is to construct uh, these very efficient interactive proofs. And the idea was to use this notion of am amortization for interactive proofs. Um, and rather than showing you the full-blown thing, we showed a restricted version just for a very special class of interactive proof. These uh, just one round things with the uniqueness property. What Omar now is describing is what are the ideas that are needed in order to extend that into amortizing general interactive proofs, which is what we want in order to construct a kind of a build-up in, in uh, Using this divide and conquer approach, how to build our, uh, our efficient interactive proofs. Well, so you're saying like the first step, first step, you're only dealing with the non-interactive thing, but later you have to divide and conquer on your whole protocol. No, it's just the non-interactive thing is kind of a warm-up. That's the idea. So uh, overall, we want to be able to amortize inter interactive proofs, just as a warm-up to show you the, the basic technique involved. Um, Omar showed how to start off with do, uh, handling the non-interactive version. And now what he's, he's describing are what are the further ideas that you need in order to handle uh, amortization of general interactive groups. I guess we're confused on why you would ever need that, because the goal, I thought, was to delegate computation and not the interactive computation, just plain computation. Right, right but in, in the divide and conquer approach, somehow we start off with uh, very basic small interactive proofs or very basic kind of uh, uh, machine computation with very small steps. And we want to compose them together into interactive proofs for longer computations. So we do start off with kind of these shorter interactive proofs. We want to build from them uh, to amortize, to combine them together into a new interactive proof for a longer computation and keep doing that uh, again and again. Hmm. So the computation, if you take computation and chop it up into pieces, each piece is still a non-interactive thing. It's a computation. Right. It's, a, it's a computation, but I kind of I want to think that recursively I assume that it has an, an interactive proof. Okay, I see. And then those interactive proofs I want to join together. Okay, thanks. So I don't know if we still have a speaker or not. <laughs> um, yeah. So this is well, at least 
for future speakers, when we say we have to connect your power supply, we're serious about it. <laughs> so let's give him a minute. He, he should be able to uh, join us in a, in a minute, I hope. Um, the Hangout does take lots of power. In the meantime, if anybody else wants to sing or something, that's okay. <laughs> Hi, Omer. Welcome back. Uh, Omer, you probably need to unmute yourself with a... Do you hear me now? Perfect, yeah. yeah. Okay, okay, sorry for that. <laughs> and Ron, did you finish the talk? Okay. Okay, so let me, uh, should I continue with uh, this, probabilistically checkable interactive proofs? Uh, or, yeah. or, the, or I expect yeah, Ron good. answered your question. No, no, so Ron, yeah, explain how come interactivity shows up during the recursion. Okay, yeah. okay. so the problem, yeah, even, yeah, uh, but Anyway, we want to work with interactive proofs, and, and yeah, we need to, to deal with that. Okay, so so now we have this object, which it's pretty pretty nice, probabilistically checkable interactive proof. So you have an interactive proof, but you can imagine that the transcript is somehow written somewhere. The verifier doesn't need to read everything in the proof; it's somehow committed to. And at the end, the verifier only needs to read a few bits from the transcript. So the verifier sends public coins one, uh, one round at a time, gets messages, but we're not, uh, we're not counting all of these messages. If, at the end, once the transcript is, is fixed, um, the, the verifier is going to probabilistically check the, the interaction. Transcript. So a one-run version is exactly PCP, and I want to mention that this is equivalent to a notion that's called interactive uh, oracle proofs uh, that was introduced independently by Ben Sasson and, and others, and and they build various nice things based on it. So you know, when things happen in parallel, it means that there is something right about about this notion. And uh, eventually, we actually need both properties at the same time. We need unambiguity, and we need the uh, probabilistic check, checking. And this is, cannot work together, right? Think about the PCP. The fact that you're going to check it only in a few locations means that if I change a few other locations that you didn't check, then you won't catch me. But somehow, there are various ways of, of handling this um, a paradox you can define and, and you choose one of them and eventually what we have is a, a way to amortize unambiguous 
probabilistically checkable interactive proofs, and that's what we need. And I think that we're already over time, so let me not mention that actually... Uh, well, they started a little late, so you can go, like... Okay. Okay, so I'll just, I'll just say that uh, I only talked about this kind of uh, uh, inner recursion. And there, there's going to be an outer recursion. As I said, you're going to divide your computation into various uh, parts of size t over k, and then recursively you're going to have a protocol that deals with each one of them, which you're going to amortize to a single protocol. And the problem is that this amortization actually increases uh, the number of bits that you're going to... So amortization increases the number of PCP IP queries, so number of locations you're going to read, and we can't just keep on amortizing. So what we need to do is also a query reduction in between. And this is uses this is less new, so I'm not emphasizing it. It uses kind of PCP-like techniques. So essentially, what you have is this. You have this combination of amortizing steps and query reduction steps, and and kind of uh, is reminiscent to some of us of this kind of zigzag kind of approaches of. You have parameters that you need to balance carefully, and you're, you have this blanket, so you push it. Your head is cold, so you push it up. Your legs are cold, you push it, in that, you push it down, and, but somehow you manage to get the, the, the blanket to cover everything. Okay. So let me go to the summary. Uh, so our main result is this constant ground interactive proofs with linear time verification for polynomial time bounded and bounded polynomial space. So this n to the delta. For that, we need this new concept, amortization, unambiguous IP, PCIP. And there are several open questions. In particular, we would like to have an efficient version of IP equals P space, where the, the prover is as efficient as it could be. So true that when you look at the um, at p space complete problem, the, the prover needs to be p, p space, uh, but uh, uh, but it doesn't need to be exponential in the space. And in general, everywhere you uh, the problem is, you need efficiency, which is essentially the efficiency of computing the function. So that would be our goal. Uh, it's a great question if you can do general NP amortization and how to do general NP amortization. We don't have a particular application in mind, but it's just an interesting question. And in general, we want to improve all the parameters of the construction. Okay. Uh, quick question. So how close do you get to IP equals P space if the language is in polynomial time and fixed polynomial space? You get efficient prover? If it's polynomial time... Because you said that the final, your protocol is general, it's just, it's, you know, you work in time polynomial in the space, but fixed polynomial. So do you yeah. almost get it? For yeah. anything, for example, space and cube and polynomial time, you get efficient prover? Right, so the, no. the prover will be efficient. The, the thing that would be is that the, the verifier won't be linear. Let me, so this is the, the general statement. So if you have time t and, and space s, yeah. uh, so polynomial time, uh, and uh, so, so the only thing that would uh, happen is that this will be mod more than linear. It will be polynomial. So verification verifier will also be polynomial. But the point is that so as long as the time, the polynomial of the time is significantly larger than the polynomial of the space, you'll That's still get some gaining. I see. So you're saying um, efficient prover only makes sense for polynomial time and like uh, anyway. So no, no, like actually that. not. So we would like. So so this result, if you remove everything that depends on epsilon, we w we would like it. <laughs> so or or if if you turn it into, if the dependence would be polynomial in one over epsilon, then everything would be. This is what we would call kind of efficient, uh, or at least 
We're not the most efficient version of IP equals P search, but it will be pretty efficient. So for example, with polynomial number of rounds, polynomial in log t number of rounds, you'll get verification time, which is polynomial in the space, and, uh, and um, right. Uh, so, so essentially, that's that's the result we more or less would call an efficient version of. Uh, so just number of rounds polynomial in one of epsilon, everything else, because I assume if epsilon is like, I don't know, like <laughs> one tenth, uh, how bad is it? I mean, it's no. So so then we'll we'll have, uh, we, and then I'll set up epsilon to be one over log t. If I set epsilon to be one over log t, and, and and Maybe can I comment? Um, yeah, please do. Just so I think you can state the the question that Omar is saying very simply. So you have some uh, computation that you could do by yourself in time t and in space s. Can you have someone prove it to you where proving uh, only takes time t for general t and s? So we do this for t, which is uh, polynomial. Can you do this for general t's? All right. Uh, so the proving is time t, and non verification has to be non-trivial. You're saying and non-trivial. It means, uh, uh, I mean, I, I don't see the slide, but it means poly s times uh, essentially poly log t or something? Or? Right. 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 So, so the, the issue is that uh, here the, the theorem statement only holds for constant epsilons. And we would right. want this to be able to do this for uh, kind of general epsilons. So if epsilon is, let's say, 1 over log t, as Omer says, yes, then it would, like, the verifier would run in like right. poly log time and polynomial in space and poly log in time. Number of rounds is poly logarithmic. So that's the dream version. I just want to make sure yes. what the dream version is. Yes, exactly. So so we don't know how to get to epsilon, which is 1 over log t. We can get something like 1 over some square root of uh, log t. Right. But we also want to improve the, we want to be able to handle this kind of epsilon and also to improve the dependence on epsilon in the number of rounds. Yes. Uh, and of course, once we have that, we can be more greedy. I mean, we can ask. Uh, to be linear in S, or I don't know. So, but this would be pretty, uh, pretty efficient. <laughs> pretty efficient, yes. But the current theorem cannot hold for epsilon equals log. I mean, never mind. You cannot prove because if you put number of rounds one over log t, uh, you know, epsilon one over log t, number of rounds will be polynomial in t, and it cannot be, yes. you know, just if the rounds are polynomial in t, you cannot, right? Absolutely, yes. So with the current thing, it just there is no hope to do it. I mean, yeah. so it's, it's only the number of rounds is polynomial on one of our epsilons. I mean, that could yeah. be maybe another intermediate goal to get polynomial on one of our epsilon. Uh, yeah. Any, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. I agree. Completely agree with you. Is there any version of your protocol with fewer level of uh, recursion where the number of rounds is polynomial but the running time is bigger? Or is there anything interesting or not? I mean, uh, the main result that we have, uh, uh, the number of rounds is constant. So we use oh, epsilon, which is constant. So then it's it's hard to completely answer the question whether it's polynomial or exponential. It's only when you look at the general case we see that our dependence is actually exponential. But we okay. would be we, yeah. If you get epsilon to be one over log t and the dependence to be polynomial, then I would say that you you definitely have a, a, a good first approximation of an efficient version of IP equals P space. And just putting a practitioner's head just for a second, uh, which, uh, is there any version where, I mean, you get non-trivial saving, I don't know, like in 10 rounds. You can say, here is a protocol which is 10 round protocol and it works for this languages, or something kind of relatively efficient, but without like asymptotics and tildes. I'm just curious. Uh, right. So, so look at the, at the the UP version that I, I mentioned. Just the five rounds, yeah, it gives you square root k rather than log k, but uh, uh, square root k is smaller than log k for uh, some potential uh, yeah values of k. Uh, so I think this by itself is not very inefficient. So if you only want, let's say t over k, I mean just save save some, yeah. Well, in particular, what I'm looking for, if, uh, I, I don't know, uh, some people like like Mike Polfish at NYU, for example, and Iran Tromber and so on, and even Eli Ben Sasson, they actually building this thing. So, uh, any, you know, any of these results have actually potential to 
improve some of those uh, snark-based uh, proofs of delegation or anything like that? Or this is like purely, I mean, amazing, but purely theoretical work, or you think they might actually be useful in those uh, systems that people are so, using? So I'll, I'll mention, I mean, I love both of these lines of, of research, and they, they do amazing stuff from things you wouldn't expect. Right. And both of them take a very different approach. Uh, so Mike's approach sometimes takes PCPs that are theoretically very inefficient, but they're still extremely useful in practice. And 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 with Ben Sasson and and many others uh, look at more efficient versions. And and I do believe that these ideas can be useful. But uh, I mean, to say it with credibility, I need to look much more deeply into. Uh, I mean. They've been, they've done excellent work and used uh, many ideas that are in the market, and I think this is a ni these are some nice ideas, and I think that potentially it could be useful. But our work is aimed at, at the theoretical results, so we didn't try to uh, to look any further. Ron, do you have anything smart to say? Just one uh, extra comment. Uh, the fact that we avoid cryptography also means that we don't need these uh, cryptographic objects, which themselves are very uh, expensive. Um, so that, that will give, give you, in, a, in that respect, it's more efficient than maybe some other SNARK-based solutions. Um, but of course, actually implementing all these PCPs and everything that I'm not an expert on, on the practical side. Did you guys, uh, just, I mean, I know it's very recent, but did you guys, like maybe like somebody like Eli Ben Sasson, who worked on POS, did you guys try to uh, talk to anybody who works on the practical side to see if there is some uh, overlap or not yet? So we, we, I mean, in particular, we have this uh, joint uh, notion with Eli and, and his collaborators. So he's definitely aware of, of, of our work, and uh, we are aware of his. And uh, if there's anybody that can can answer if there is practical uh, application, I'm sure. If there are practical implications, I'm sure he'll he'll, he'll find them. So we Omar, are, I have a question. Um, if if you're willing to use multiple interactive provers, is is this stuff was this stuff known before, or is it still new? So like with a double efficient verifier and all this. Repeating something that somebody smart said before, yeah, I think it's it's easy. Uh, if, right, that's what Ron said, I think. Okay, thanks. As long as these provers are kind of in separate rooms and can't talk to each other. Okay, seems like. Uh, oh, uh, sorry. If there's no more question, what can we actually try pushing the the sound icon to see what happens? Okay, let's do that. Uh, <laughs> I think you're the only one hearing it. But I'm it only the great. only one hearing it. Sounds it. great, yeah. I mean, it looks great. Huh? We don't hear so it. It's, a, it's a, an elevator music. I thought <laughs> that uh, sometimes when when you only ask the attention of part of the audience, uh, so right, the other the other part of the audience should have something uh, to entertain them, and uh, okay. elevator music have been used <laughs> for this purpose for a while. So I thought, why not? Uh, We'll add that for next time. This is a good feature to have here. Yeah. <laughs> Any more questions? OK. So thank you uh, for thank attention. You, Sorry for the uh, technical problems. We used to. It. <laughs> thank you, Omar. It's uh, something that's everywhere. OK. Thank you, Omar. And uh, Nidia, do you want to remind us? Uh, so it's unkit in two weeks, right? Yeah, it's unkit in two weeks, and Eric play for two weeks from then. So four weeks from now, it's Eric play. So Thank you, everyone. Good. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Omar. Thank you. Uh, everyone's welcome to stay. Let me take the broadcast offline.